And so the question is, what future are we really shooting for here? And that was a perfect question for the global stock take to take up. It also was an incredibly difficult one. Welcome to Global Dispatches, a podcast for the foreign policy and global development communities and anyone who wants a deeper understanding of what is driving events in the world today. I'm your host, Mark Leon Goldberg. I am a veteran international affairs journalist and the editor of UN Dispatch. Enjoy the show. The big international climate change conference, known as COP28, concluded in Dubai on December 13th, one day later than its scheduled end date. Negotiators went into overtime to hammer out an agreement that, for the first time, addressed the politically fraught question of phasing out fossil fuels. Joining me to discuss that key outcome and other significant results of COP28 is Pete Ogden, Vice President for Climate and Environment at the United Nations Foundation. We kick off discussing why this COP in particular was an important moment for the Paris Agreement goal of limiting global warming to at least 1.5 degrees Celsius. We then discuss the contentious politics and diplomacy around an agreement to phase out fossil fuels and other important outcomes of COP28. This conversation is obviously very timely. COP28 wrapped up really just a few hours ago, and this episode will give you good context for understanding why this was an important moment for international climate diplomacy. So we have a few more episodes in store for you before the end of the year. We don't really ever take a break here on Global Dispatches, and I'm really excited for what we have in store in 2024. As always, please consider supporting the show through a premium subscription. You can pay for a subscription on globaldispatches.org or via patreon.com slash globaldispatches or directly in the Apple Podcasts app. Please just do whatever is easiest for you and thank you. Now here is my conversation with Pete Ogden of the United Nations Foundation. So, Pete, before we discuss what happened at COP28, can I have you set the scene a little bit and explain why even prior to delegates arriving in Dubai, this COP was imbued with a particular significance? There were three main storylines heading into the COP this year. I mean, one, kind of at the macro level, this is the hottest year on record. We are ever more severely impacted by climate change, and there's just more and more political attention, popular attention to the issue. This was going to be the biggest, most widely attended COP in history, far bigger in terms of the number of participants than the Paris COP or the Paris Agreement was struck in 2015 or any of the COPs since. By some counts, more than 70,000 people participated. And I, having been there, I suspect that number is probably a little bit low. So there was an incredible amount of energy, interest, around the issue and seeing what countries could get done. The second sort of theme had to do really with where we are in the Paris Agreement cycle itself. This is the year of the first global stock take under the Paris Agreement. You'll have to explain what that is to those who are not familiar with the global stock take, which is a important issue idea embedded in the Paris Agreement. Yeah, absolutely. So the Paris Agreement has in it a couple of critical elements. One is that every five years, starting in 2015, countries would set new national targets. In the in-between year, at the midpoint of those years, so here we are between 2020 and 2025, 2023 is a global stock take where countries come together to evaluate where they stand, how the adequacy of their actions to date measure up with the stated goals of the Paris Agreement. 
So what this COP initiates is a year of very intensive introspection by countries who are going to have to formulate now what they want their 2035 national greenhouse gas target to be in light of this deeper understanding, this global stock take of all of the factors out there, where the technologies are, where the challenges are, where other countries are. And so it doesn't take a lot of expertise to know that they are not on track. The question is, how can you come together to give the political steer necessary so that countries, when they go back into their target setting mode next year, do so with the right ideas in mind? And, and hopefully, you know, in a year's time, they'll have new targets that will be more aligned with the science. And so this just emphasizes, because I, I think this is one of the key inputs and outputs from this COP, is that this COP in particular, because it marks this stock take moment, is the opportunity for countries, unlike previous COPs, to more deliberately reset their national targets and get together to discuss how they might reset their national targets in order to reach that 1.5 degree target. That's exactly right. And interestingly, too, as a side note, this is the first official global stock take. Even though targets were set in 2015 in Paris, there was really not much hope at the time or expectation that the Paris Agreement would come into force by 2017 when that first stock take would need to occur. And so they decided, well, the first real stock take will happen after between the 2020 and 2025 pledging moments. I mean, of course, as it turned out, it did come into effect in record time, but this was really the very first official global stock take. So in addition to setting the kind of expectations for what countries are going to put on the table next year, as you said, it also was a bit of a test of figuring out what exactly a global stock take can and should do. And the third key theme heading in. The third big theme really is about fossil fuels. This was sort of elevated by the fact of the United Arab Emirates, obviously a country that's political economy is really built around fossil fuels, taking on the presidency. Then they're appointing as the COP president, the head of their national oil company. So it was really foregrounded right there and then. And, you know, it caused a lot of controversy over the course of the year about what role fossil fuel industry would have, you know, what role they play. And, you know, you'd think in some level, if you hadn't kind of been following this issue for a while, that this would have been front and center for a long time. But the truth is that the COP process had really not waded into the issue of fossil fuels explicitly very much. I mean, until a couple of years ago, when there was an agreement to reduce pollution from coal specifically, it had been avoided because, you know, at the end of the day, you need a consensus outcome. And these are issues that are really highly divisive with some countries, you know, with deeply entrenched fossil fuel interests. And so instead, a lot of the focus had been on the clean energy side of the equation and largely, you know, having to be sort of silent about coming to consensus about what to do about the fossil fuel side of the equation. And it wasn't just the fact that the UAE was the host of the COP and who they appointed as a president. I mean, you know, you look around the world, you look at the United States with record-breaking oil production at the same time as it's got its historic climate legislation in place. You can see that we are kind of at a place where these two issues, the clean energy economy, fossil fuel powered economy, are both kind of thriving. And so the question is, what future are we really shooting for here? And that was a perfect question for the global stock take to take up. It also was an incredibly difficult one. And so that going in, people knew it was going to be a major, major challenge for this COP. So let's start there. How did this COP deal with the question of fossil fuels, in particular, the need to phase out fossil fuels if we're going to want to keep global warming in check with the Paris Agreement goal of 1.5 degrees Celsius. They fought hard about it. And it was the issue that kept them fighting hard about that into overtime. When you say they fought hard, having covered UN negotiations for a long time, you know, I know that by they, the antecedent to the pronoun, 
refers to like blocks of countries. What were some of the blocks of countries that had particularly strong positions on this? And how did these negotiations play out? So it wasn't just countries, because clearly there is huge interest in civil society and in the fossil industry itself in how this issue played out. So formally, at the end of the day, it is the countries themselves that have to all come together behind some specific agreed language. Paris Agreement is ultimately a bargain among countries. When you have 70,000 plus people at the COP, and this is the biggest issue, you get a lot of input. And there's a lot of side banter and effects and efforts to try to really shape those outcomes. But in terms of the countries themselves, you know, you have a whole spectrum of countries all with different interests. You know, you have countries like Saudi Arabia and, you know, that have for a long time been very, very committed to preserving their fossil fuel industry, obviously, for obvious reasons. You have countries like the United States, where you know, a couple of years ago, I think part of the reason that the COP was able to start to address coal power in particular was because the U.S., we really turned the corner on coal generation, but issues around what about oil and gas, where production continues to grow substantially here in the United States, make that more complicated once you expand outside of the coal space into these other areas. You also have developing countries who are worried too rapid of a transition away from fossil fuel to renewables could impede their own development. They don't think that they can access these newer technologies quickly enough and their priorities are, you know, get basic electrification, fundamental needs for economic development. So they worry in some cases about those, but they also worry very much about the impacts of climate change. So, you know, it's a delicate dance. You know, you have another country like China, who, unlike the United States, is still in a mode of expanding its coal capacity, although, like the United States, is massively invested in building out its renewables too. So you have almost every country is in, in a bit of a unique situation, but that was the reason that until this COP, the issue ultimately had to sort of be put on the back burner and instead focus on areas where they could come together. And here it just, as the couple of weeks evolved, it became clear that that wasn't gonna be an option if this whole COP was going to be seen as a success at all. So in order for this COP to be considered a success, they needed, and by they, I mean countries that were negotiating the final outcome document, needed to say something about phasing out fossil fuels or transitioning from fossil fuels, have some language about Mm -hmm. fossil fuels in there for the first time. And it's my understanding that it really wasn't until the 11th hour, or really like the 13th hour, these things went over a bit, that indeed language was agreed. This is the language that was agreed, that countries would transition, quote, away from fossil fuels in energy systems in a just, orderly, and equitable manner, accelerating action in this critical decade so as to achieve net zero by 2050 in keeping with the science. And this was the first time that such an agreement was made at a COP. What do you make of that consensus language? Well, I mean, you can see that it's carefully worded. (laughs) Um, And I think they're able to achieve consensus around it because on the one hand, it does for the first time explicitly bring fossil fuels and not just coal, but the fate and future of fossil fuels into the Paris Agreement itself. And Crossing that Rubicon, I think, was critical, even if it wasn't the most desired outcome by some, but I think that ultimately became the kind of acceptable threshold. But you also see that there's a clear sense in the timelines there that this is going to be part of a transition. And elsewhere in the outcome document, there's a reference to the use of transition fuels, (laughs) hence, as the name suggests, that would play a role in that transition. And this is this is a not so subtle nod at natural gas. Yeah, exactly. So there is a recognition again, but that said, until now there had not been a discussion about a transition, which presumably is a transition 
offer away, even if that never gets stated or hasn't yet been stated. And the ultimate goal of that transition is time bound. They have this 2050 expression, what you just read about reaching net zero at that time. And unless there's a huge explosion in technology that can be used to capture fossil fuels emissions, that's going to put a huge pressure on displacing fossil fuel with renewable energy. And that was one of the other major issues. And a bit of that was suggested when the US and China had their meeting several weeks ago in Sunnylands. And there they began to develop some of this thinking about, well, are we really talking about replacement? Are we talking about taking fossil fuels and replacing them with clean energy? I think that was a more politically acceptable way of talking about that transition, especially in a place like China, where, as I said, they're still trying to add significant amounts of new capacity. And for them, I think they're saying that as they do that, what they can do is try to back out the fossil mm-hmm. piece with the clean energy piece, but they're not implying a kind of absolute lid on the fossil side as a start. So I get that this language on fossil fuels is institutionally significant for the Paris Agreement, the COP process, and international climate diplomacy. But in what ways do you expect, if any, will this language have like real world impact? Well, I think the biggest thing will be how countries interpret it when they are next year hard at work devising their next round of greenhouse gas emission targets and their plans for how to achieve those. So in some ways, we won't know for a little while, but not too long (laughs) because they really have to get to work on figuring that out. And it takes a lot of time and analysis. And I think we're going to find out how much they take this to heart, how much they're seeking loopholes in the understanding. But, you know, it helps when you have this consensus document. There aren't too many of them in this space in a highly disputed issue area. And I think they've created a new floor here that's you know a higher floor than we were on two weeks ago. So the fossil fuel question got a lot of attention uh, because it was so significant for reasons we discussed. Are there any other important outcomes from COP that you want to highlight and note? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and we, and we focused here on really the, the biggest, most contentious and divisive issue. But there were a lot of really exciting and promising new agreements and announcements that are you know, engineered in advance and announced over the course of the two weeks, which don't necessarily include every country, but rather subsets, coalitions, public-private partnerships, or other kind of innovative arrangements. And there's so much going on. I mean, at the very beginning of the week, right at the outset, countries agree to operationalize a brand new climate fund on loss and damage is the term of art. So the loss and damage fund is designed to help countries cope with the impacts of climate change. It's not about helping countries to necessarily, you know, reduce their emissions. It's what do you do for those countries who are already getting hammered by these impacts and suffering from these consequences, especially the vulnerable, most vulnerable people in the most vulnerable countries who did next to nothing to create this situation. And, you know, this has been something that had been debated and argued about for years and years and years. And last year, there was a kind of breakthrough at last year's COP in Sharm El Sheikh, kind of an agreement in principle to set something like this up. And this year, 12 months later, they managed to quickly build so much support that they were able to announce how they would operationalize it right at the beginning of the COP and over $700 million of pledged funding for it. So again, that's not a huge amount in terms of the total cost of climate change, but it's, you know, it's significant that there's a recognition for need, the needs in this space, and that there's enough political agreement about its importance that, it, that an issue that took years and years and years to argue over, you know, on the f- first few days of the COP, you know, they're able to quickly rally around it. You know, some other, you know, important announcements, the countries agree to a new goal of tripling renewable energy capacity by 2030. They agreed to double the rate of energy efficiency by 2030 globally. I mean, these are all 
targets that, you know, we've never had before. And I think we're, again, driven by the recognition that we need to start setting targets and goals that are in line with the Paris agreements. And these are all goals that will help to really push in that direction and will be very helpful in helping countries decide and set their own national targets because these are going to help be guideposts to where we need to get to. And I'd say that also the last piece is there's been a proliferation of political declarations too that countries and other stakeholders rally around in areas that also that the cops used to not really delve into much, such as around food issues. There was a major declaration with 120 plus signatories about the importance of focusing on the intersections of the climate, food, and agricultural challenges. So, you know, with the kind of growing profile of the COP and the surge of more and more stakeholders into the space, you are seeing lots of new areas for cooperation and expansion. You see those sort of proliferating along with the attendance list. Well, Pete, thank you so much for this helpful and very timely breakdown. Great. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for listening to Global Dispatches. The show is produced by me, Mark Leon Goldberg. It is edited and mixed by Levi Sharp. If you are listening on Apple Podcasts, make sure to follow the show and enable automatic downloads to get new episodes as soon as they're released. On Spotify, tap the bell icon to get a notification when we publish new episodes. And of course, please visit globaldispatches.org to get on our free mailing list, get in touch with me, and access our full archive. Thank you.